the stakeholders in our present educational system are at fault. That would be the, the mothers, the fathers, the educators, the teachers, the government. Just stop and think. Um, I, I saw, I read an article recently that said, fire all the school boards. And I said, well, that's a good idea. <laughs> it really is. Why should we be fr fractured? If, if you look at if you look at the countries that succeed well in education, they all have national systems. Finland, Norway, Sweden, all of the great systems, they're national systems. National money, national standards. What do we have in the United States? Man, it's it's spread out all over. You got the people in Kansas, they want to teach, they want to they want to teach creationism. You got the people in Texas to determine what textbooks you're gonna buy in Massachusetts because of the way the name of the game is played with the textbook industry. That's what's going on. So why should we fractionalize it? Here, you've got uh, uh, Westchester, or, or uh, here, uh, Lincoln, Massachusetts, great school system. If you go into South Boston, how great a school system is that? Well, they finance it through property taxes, the most regressive system of taxation you can have is property taxes. Little wonder, that the poor people never get a chance to get out of the slums because they can't get educated in the slums. And yet, oh, we all buy into that. You don't hear anybody talk about that. You don't hear anybody say that our system of funding education sucks. You don't hear them talk about that. Oh, and you don't hear them say, that, here, in our system of education, children go to school for 180 days in the United States. In, in Europe, it's over 200 days. In Japan, it's 240 days. And so a teacher wants to get paid, I'll tell you, under my system, they'll get paid, they work 12 months a year. Then there's three months off, and the kids go to school 12 months a year. You can have vacations, but, but in reason, you, you educate the kids. You stop coddling our children. They're gonna compete in the real world, and there's nothing wrong with that. And, and this, you know, but that gives you a little bit of idea how I approach the whole education problem. I'm no genius in education. There's a lot of people that know that the problems are there. And what you want to do is you want to empower the people to be able to make laws and go at this with tooth and tong. And, 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 it, and first off, you know that it has to be competitive. This stuff that to have a monopoly of public education I've given that up a long time ago. I don't believe in monopolies, whether it's government monopolies or private monopolies. End of story. You have automatic competition so that you bring about the best in people, whether it's educators or students or administrators. We need super teachers and we need super principals. We need small classrooms, 15 people in a classroom where you have a teacher and a moderator so that you can deal with these people directly. And you don't turn around and punish the poor schools for non-performance. You turn around and you put the money there because they need the greatest degree of help. I hope that begins to give you some idea. Um, I see your book has a floor by Ralph Nader. So I was wondering why are you running as a Democratic candidate as opposed to like a third party? Well, I first, uh, first I've been a Democrat all my life. I was a Democrat in the Senate. And secondly, uh, <laughs> I'm right. and be proud of being Democrat. In fact, I'm, I'm angry with the Democratic leadership right now. When I said that they're being taken up, here, I'm angry with the Clintons. In 1992, the Clintons, uh, with the DLC, took the Democratic Party, took it over to Wall Street, and it's been there ever since. And the Democratic Party that I'm for is the Democratic Party of Franklin Roosevelt. You gotta keep in mind, it was Franklin Roosevelt that passed, the first law that was passed was the Glass-Steagall Act. You know who repealed the Glass-Steagall Act? That was Bill Clinton in 1998, and that's what's caused all of this mess we got on Wall Street, all these shenanigans that's going on in the, uh, in the subprime, and you name it, and that was the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act, and, uh, and the Secretary of uh, the Treasury, uh, who was under Clinton, left the Treasury and four months later went to uh, Citigroup and at $40 million a year as the executive, as the chairman of the executive committee got his reward from Citigroup 
for a repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act. I become president, that's the first thing we're going to put back in place is the Glass-Steagall Act, breaking up the insurance companies from the banking and from the brokerage houses. That collusion is what's corrupting Wall Street. And that's the reason why Wall Street is pouring this amount of money into the Democratic coffers. Does it, does it strike you as odd that Chuck Schumer, a Democratic leader from New York, is making sure that we don't change, we don't change the law, or that these hedge fund guys that are making a billion dollars a year in wages, that they pay 15% on their wages, while your parents are paying 35 to 40% on their wages, and you won't change the law to do that? Of course not. We're raising too much money on Wall Street. Do you think we're going to bring about any equity? Of course, we're not going to change any system of taxation, because why are we going to change it? it we, that's how we take care of our friends. It's a maglev system that would then transport hydrogen gas and hydrogen liquid and high-tension wires on a transportation system all built into one. Now, they, they weren't asking for government money. They just wanted to be able to get the licenses to go forward, raise the money to do it. And, and here, we have right now in Washington to connect Dulles Airport with downtown Washington, and the federal government wouldn't spend a sou to bring it about with mass transit. And so everybody drives their cars out there to do that. Isn't that sick? That could be a model to do it. Yeah, I've tried to induce some people in Las Vegas. Look at people are, are flying from Las Vegas to, uh, to uh, from Los Angeles. Build a maglev system from there, and you'll be able to go, go to Las Vegas at 400, 500 miles an hour and, and gamble your heart out. But, but no, the, we don't see the leadership to do this, and yet it's there on the shelf, and that would do it. Now, first thing I would do as president, I would, now here you gotta have the people in power to make laws. I would turn to you and say, look at, <clears throat> We are, if, if we continue what we're doing, we're going to cook the human race off the planet in 100 years. This is a crisis. This is a war. This is not Al-Qaeda problem. This is affecting everybody. And so what we've got to do is we've got to put a carbon tax on. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to put a carbon tax on, and I'm going to ask you to vote for it. The American people will vote for it. The Congress won't vote for it, but the American people will. They've got rational brains. They'll put the carbon tax on. Then we'll invite all the other countries in the world to join us with a carbon tax on their people. You will be surprised. The oil countries will put on a carbon tax. Here, uh, the only country that I know that has extensive hydrogen fuel is Norway, an oil country. 80% of its revenue comes from oil. That's Norway. And so with this carbon tax, Worldwide, we take this pool of money and we integrate the global scientific and engineering community to get the entire world off of carbon in a decade. In a decade, we will be laughing a generation from now and say, How stupid could we be? Oil is so vital, so vital for our, for our construction, medicine, plastics, all of that, that we were using this to propel our automobiles. How stupid and wasteful <laughs> could this be? And we could do this if we had leadership. You want, to show, want me to show you how stupid your Congress is? And, and I say this as a Democrat, I'm ashamed. You know, and, and Pelosi, oh, delighted to see a woman become Speaker. She hasn't done any better than a man. And <laughs> shameful, shame on her. You know, but stop and think. She used to say, oh, what a great job we did with the energy bill. You know what they did? They passed an energy bill in the year 2020. The CAFE standards for the American fleet is going to be 35 miles a gallon. China does better than that right now. The EU does 44.2 miles a gallon right now. And we're going to have 35 miles a gallon 12 years from now. Is that leadership? Now, and, the, and our primary effort is with ethanol. Now, it takes more energy to produce a gallon of ethanol than you get out of a gallon of ethanol. And that's the good news. <laughs> the bad news is it takes 12,000 gallons of water to produce an equivalent gallon of gasoline of ethanol. And 
So you're going to watch the aquifers in the central part of the United States just go down before your eyes, and we're going to decimate our ability to farm in the middle part of this continent. I mean, this is the Congress of the United States that's made this our top priority. Now, of course, I say this with all due respect. I've been a member of Congress. This doesn't get any stupider than that. It truly doesn't. Now, does this surprise you that this is the same Congress that passed the legislation that says for the drug legislation for the seniors that you cannot negotiate a volume discount for the drugs that go for the seniors in this country? Does, is there anybody within the sound of my voice that doesn't recognize that any kind of activity where you deal in volume that you can get a better price than purchasing it on a single basis? But this is your leadership in Congress that does this. Now, maybe, maybe you might believe me when I say that you ought to empower yourselves to make laws. I think you can do a better job than that. Trust me, you can do a better job than your leadership in governing yourselves. And I, could, and I don't have enough hours in a day to tell you all the examples where you can do a better job. Trust yourselves. Next question. This will have to be the last question. Okay, well, you're the boss. And then I, I assume you have final remarks as well. I think oh, I have final remarks. There we go. <laughs> Please. Oh, I was wondering what you thought, Senator Bell, of one of your fellow candidates for president, Representative Ron Paul. The, a lot of people identify us, and also uh, Kucinich together. Uh, we're not really the same uh, cut of cloth. I have a lot of parts of me that are libertarian. In fact, after the Democratic uh, August election, I would hope if Ron doesn't get the nomination, does seem doesn't want it, I want the nomination of the, of the Libertarian Party. I want the nomination of the Green Party and, uh, and, and, and any other party that would have me. Because I want to be on the ballot in, uh, in, uh, in November, on November 3rd. Uh, Ron uh, is, a, is, a, is a funny kind of libertarian for me, because when I'm a libertarian, I believe in civil rights. That's libertarianism. So that means if you're gay and you want to get married to your friend there, I, I think that's okay. Now, Ron, Paul, Ron Paul has a problem with that. I don't. Now, that's, that's libertarianism from my point of view, because that's civil rights. You can do what the hell you want, in or out of the bedroom. Okay? So, and, and that's just part of it. You know, he believes that, uh, that uh, you know, when it comes to health care, that everything should be privatized. Well, I don't believe in that. I don't believe in privatizing the military. I don't believe in uh, we need uh, black water around. Uh, so so we, we have our differences in that area. But Ron, uh, bless his soul, is against the war. Uh, he's against the military industrial complex. And so if I were to become president, and if he were to endorse me and bring in the libertarians to my cause, I would uh, help make him, I'd, I probably would appoint him uh, the uh, uh, Secretary of Defense with the proviso that he cut the defense budget by 60% in the first year. And, uh, and the only way we'll do that is... <laughs> and people say, well, how would you do that? You know, it's easy. First off, I can't do it unless you become lawmakers. And the minute you become lawmakers, I will turn around and say, uh, give me a line item veto. And then I'll have line item veto, and I'll sit in the Oval Office, and I'll have the Secretary of Defense, Ron Paul, and a few other advisors, and we'll sit there with a big red pen, and we'll go through the military authorization uh, authorization bill, and we'll go look at that. Well, what is that for? Well, that's those 12 holes that we want to spend $100 billion in Poland, you know, to, I don't know who we're going to do that out. We're going to close, we're going to pour sand and delta those holes we got in Delta Junction. Pour sand down in those holes that don't do any good to anybody. We spent a billion, a hundred billion dollars on that stuff in Alaska that don't do anything. The only threat we have in the world is from Al Qaeda. That's a criminal threat. So we'll pour a lot of money into Interpol. We'll really provide for a, an international intelligence system that works. Now clearly, we're, we've always, we can't even put the dots together in the United States. Now, how well do you think we're doing it in the world? And we're not doing a good job. You know, Interpol has a database in Switzerland. 
where they where they log in all of the stolen uh, uh, passports. You know something? The United States has never once logged into that database, <laughs> nor has Britain, and all the other countries that have they log into it regularly, and that's how they deal with the, the supposed threat of uh, of terrorists. I begin to wonder what is going on. You know, when you see government do stupid things here and there, you've got to assume that they're doing stupid things a little bit all over. <laughs> all over. And, and all I can say is, and these are my closing remarks, uh, and you know, you fancy that you're, you live in a free country. Well, let me give you the definition from uh, Cicero of what freedom is. What is freedom? Freedom is participation in power. What is the central power of government? Lawmaking. Until you are able to make laws, you are not free and never have been. You just don't know it. Thank you very much.